Welcome friends. Thanks for joining DeFi Logic Symposium Sunday every Sunday at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. As a member of the DeFi Logic server, you can join our call every week and discuss in real time. Link is in the description below. DeFi Logic is the crypto think tank for better decisions. In today's community call, we'll review the pulse of Ondo market movement and strategic insights for the weekly dose theme and weekly market callbacks with Eddie with a discussion from GeForce about the enduring presence of inflation. And we'll get started over to Roth and Trill for an overview of Ondo. Over to you guys. All right, so since Ondo is on the Ethereum EVM network, we can take a look at some analytics on Nansen. The token was deployed back in April 2022, which so is a couple years old. Currently, the fully diluted valuation is sitting right around $8 billion. 24-hour net flows is about 62000 positive, and the current price is just under $0.80 cents with a drop of about 12% in the last week. And if we look at the balances, these are the top wallet holdings. So obviously the Ondo Finance Treasury is the number one with 76%. And then we have the Bybit Hot Wallet, a few other exchange hot wallets, and then Pantera Capital is the number one. And they've got several, about seven different wallets here, and then a few others. And then if we look at the distribution, yeah, the majority is either held by Ondo Finance Treasury or centralized exchanges. And then the token distribution, 15% of the addresses hold about 83% of the tokens and they've been holding for a one, one to two year period. And then the top exchanges are Bybit, Gate, Coin1, Mexi, KuCoin. <clears throat> and then there's a couple different liquidity pairs here on Uniswap. There's three different pairs of on Uniswap for the wrapped ETH Ondo pools. Currently one has a $13 million TVL. And then looked at some of the tokens held by smart money wallets. So there's about 671 million tokens held by 55 so-called smart money holders. And I looked at some of the, the balances and we saw there's a few here that hold some other tokens. The majority that I was looking at are mostly just holding Ondo by itself, but there's a few others. I like this one, True Ventures. They have a good amount of USDC and then a few other altcoins. Some I've never heard of, like the B-I-C-O-S-D-O-L-A-S. And then we have the investor distribution here, which has some YG, which is a yield games. Well, Gamify token, some RSR, and some other RWA assets, and then a few other D DeFi tokens such as Maker and One Inch, and then Golden Tree here has a few other altcoin tokens as well. And we got Shima Capital, mostly Ondo, and then some stable coins. And then Aros Global has mostly Ondo, some Wrapped ETH, and then some Pepe and and others. And that's pretty much it. And then if we look at the actual Ondo Finance website, they're currently offering 5.20% APY on their US dollar yield. And then the US Treasury is offering almost 5% APY. And then if we go to the Flux Finance, there's different options for lending and borrowing. So currently, if you wanted to, to lend USDC, it's almost at 5% and there's about almost $4 million of TVL. And then for borrowing here, it's a little bit higher with 5.25% with 275,000 TVL. And then these are the markets available for lending and borrowing. We got USDC, USDT, DAI, FRAX, and then OUSG. And that's pretty much it for the analytics. So if Joe wants to take over from here. Go over a little bit of the history before I like, go over the technical stuff. Of, as far as the history, it was founded by two people, Nathan Allman and King Headquarters in New York City. At least the entirety of the team have a background in a lot of the big tech companies like Microsoft, Facebook, Goldman Sachs, things like that. As far as Ondo and self, uh, I do think it's a little bit of an interesting project. Uh, at least the project itself focuses on the concept of real world assets and then providing utility to those assets. They do uh, coin themselves as like being the first to 
tokenized real world assets. Uh, depending on how far back you've been listening to the symposiums, there's another project that's like done, so done something similar, at least try to name tangible. But as far as with Ondo, they tokenize, Stoff mentioned, the which is treasuries. Um, then I'll go over at least exactly what they say that is. USG, yeah. Tokenize at least black, black rock short term treasuries. The USD, the USDY is definitely a really interesting. It's not available for US citizens, but according to Ondo Finance, it goes a much stricter, a much stricter venting process than most other tokens, things like that. They do think it's more secure than USDT. As far as some attributes or characteristics to USDY, they uh, believe it's bankruptcy remote. Ondo were to go remote, to go bankrupt, they you know believe that US the integrity of USDY would still be, be withheld. As far as obtaining USDY, that goes back to the venting process. Yeah, it's an extensive KYC. You have to hold for 40 days before you can even transfer, not just sell, transfer. And that also goes into as far as their confidence or the confidence in the token. And they also claim that they over collateralized any payment of USDY to any holders. They they say themselves they're over 3% collateralized. And see, they also say their reserves are verified every single day as far uh, compared to USDT, which I believe is really, yeah, quarterly. And um, as far as like where they're trying to head with the entirety of everything, because so as far as the components with uh, Ondo Finance, we have USDY, we have OUSG, we have OMMF, and then we also have the Ondo token, which is the governance token, which manages the Flux Finance Protocol. Ondo to the Ondo token is, or the holders of the Ondo token become voters in the Ondo DAO. And then the Ondo DAO is backed by the Ondo Foundation. Ondo, the Ondo project created the Flux Finance Protocol. They sold it to the Ondo DAO slash foundation to um, manage the flux or the growth of flux finance. Another interesting thing about flux finance is it acts as a repo market for if you obviously are lending and you over collateralize, then you lose your collateral. So they can obtain their OUSG back. As far as the future of Ondo, they want to bring more utility to the real world asset project because as far as all they have at the moment is usdy ousg and flux finance and they they have i guess acknowledged that that's not the ultimate goal at least for real world asset utility in crypto because their goal is to bridge traditional finance with DeFi decentralized finance as far as Ondo GM, global markets, as the name states, they plan to make real world or tokenize real world assets global. Their explanation of this is similar, not similar to a stock, but as far as like how they plan on having their, the technical side of their global markets, they plan to use the blockchain as just messaging system, or I guess that's like how they're doing it already, but the blockchain will just facilitate the transaction of the traditional finance. They want to take the longevity and the, yeah, the security that we have in uh, traditional finance and improve it by using the speed, the flexibility and the power of, that's pretty much the goals of Onda, merging the two and doing it in an effective and a manner that actually would be beneficial to the people that's using it, not to just say we're doing it and we're having something that we're doing something like, oh, we tokenized the PS4 because it's real world asset, but we tokenize something real, which is like traditional finance and they plan to add much more utility. I guess from an investor standpoint, you just gotta look at what you would want 
from, I guess, your goals specifically from the project, then that would determine what token or coin you would be going for because obviously each coin does different things and allows you to do different things. And the USDY is not for uh, US citizens, but yeah, any questions? I do this week. So I thought this write up was quite interesting. One thing that you touched on was given the significant control of the token governance through the Ando DAO, I am curious how Ando Finance is going to ensure that the Ando token distribution does not lead to centralization of power. Therefore, it's going to affect the decentralized nature of the ecosystem, like what they're striving for. So I thought that was really interesting. And I was actually trying to look this up while you guys were talking, but there's some backers to Ando Finance. It seems like there's a group of 23 of them, but like Coinbase Ventures is on there, Pantera Capital is on there, Wintermute is on there, and I was trying, of course, the rest were hidden from me. I was trying to pull up some more, but it looks like yeah, they're they... heavily backed, right? Yeah. So it's interesting. It isn't open to. You can kind of see it also on all the pages, like all the company names are definitely heavily backed by, by some big notable corporations. Even though they are U.S. Uh, corporations. No, U.S. I thought it was interesting. U.S. investors are supposed to take part in this, but there's a lot of, it's interesting, the companies that are backing this as well. So I thought that was one thing that kind of sparked my interest just to keep an eye on and see and then like anything that has to do with real world world assets ando's fairly new right their token is in january 2024 but the ando itself how long have they been around i think i missed it 2021 okay interesting yeah i'm curious i saw the example you popped up and i want to keep an eye on this because i'm curious as to how Ando Finance plans to maintain that security and trust of the users while, of course, also managing the tokenization and the transfer of real world assets through its platform. That's always the big thing. Those are my questions, at least, that I saw Pepe popped up. So let's see if he has anything. Yeah, just to touch on your question. Yeah, I would agree. And as far as the Ando token itself, supply is not even 20% of the governance token is even circulating. At least as far as the the begs the question, like you said, the control, who knows how it will be dispersed uh, and like, the ongoing transactions of the token. And as far as, I think when Sloth just mentioned some of the holdings, it was a little bit skewed to some big or some wallets holding a big amount, but they, they hold a pretty significant amount. Yeah, as far as fine or flux finance, the proposals going there, they obviously have a big say in there. But then again, not even 90 or 75 percent of the entirety of the Ando tokens are released yet. So it just got to wait and see how they're going to handle that situation. Yeah, I was just coming up to say that real world assets is a long term narrative with probably the biggest use case for crypto i would say in bridging traditional finance like drill was talking about with web3 it's gonna be really interesting when that happens larry fink from blackrock was talking about how important that is and basically the tokenization of what Trill was alluding to is like stocks, right? Like you could buy and sell stocks on chain and it would be like self custody or, or could be depending on how they do it, which would be really interesting because we know that with like GameStop and all these other stocks, because they're centrally controlled, a lot of times the brokers can stop trading, right? Which, yeah, again, that happened with GameStop. I think that happened with AMC as well when they were going parabolic like a meme coin. And that's a lot of the reason why there's not so much volatility, I would say, in traditional markets is that they're controlled, right? But the trading is not as controlled in crypto. That's why we see these massive pump and dumps and extreme volatility. The thing that I'm interested to see in the future would be if they somehow tokenize these assets on chain and maintain the same control measures to mitigate trading they could do that a little bit technically over my head but i i know they could do that it's more of a question if will they do that because i think things 
in the long term, if, if inflation gets worse and stuff like that, and other issues with the monetary system that we have, just globally speaking, they might actually remove those controls so there is more volatility in the market to generate more wealth and create a little bit more, I don't know, like noise really away from the monetary system itself being a, a total scam basically and controlled by, in my view, nefarious actors really, selfish individuals and institutions that eventually are going to die out. But in the meantime, this might be a way that they can offset some of the responsibility and introduce a lot more volatility into the market that had not been there before because of control measures. A lot of speculation on my part. That's what I see as a potential in the future. So let's pump and dump Google stock, huh? Yeah, you can somewhat already do that with uh, synthetics. I don't know how the stocks work, but I know for sure they have Forex and commodities markets as well. You can do leverage trading on those silver and gold perpetuals, and then I think some other currencies too, like the euro and, and other ones. Yeah, hopefully John comes up here because I was talking to him about this years ago, and he said that he's skeptical of the synthetics. They do have, or they did have, I haven't looked at it in a long time, but they do have like major, probably like you call them like blue chip stocks as synthetics. I can't remember what chains they were on or what chain. I don't remember if it was one or more. They did have yeah, synthetics. But... Ones. I know they have it available on base. I think I think it's mostly EVM chains. So it's Ethereum and then other ones like base and optimism. Arbitrum, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Which are still EVM. But yeah, to segue, and I'll, I'll let John fill everybody in, but when I brought this up to John, he was skeptical because he was saying it was basically like a derivative on top of, of a derivative. So maybe he could explain that. And he said, that obviously, is not a good idea. It'll be interesting if they do tokenize it, then it takes that entire problem away of a derivative on top of a derivative where it can blow up. But I think John has a lot more expertise in that area. So segue over to him. Yeah, I'll just say real quick, the concept of derivative on top of derivatives is a, a major issue because it's leverage on top of leverage and there's really no underlying asset or the underlying asset actually gets lost and that could be a, a solution is what you mentioned Pepe is tokenizing the actual derivative so then and you're actually got a base that you're actually trading or a base asset I remembered when they did a, a new ETN which is an exchange traded note instead of exchange traded fund. That note is basically a contract that a bank does to try and track the underlying asset. And when they did that with natural gas several years ago, it blew up. Natural gas went the total opposite direction of most of these ETNs and the whole ETN for natural gas market blew up and they didn't do ETNs for about another five years and then they started rolling those back in. A derivative on top of derivative is not a good solution or a good investment yes i would just say i think it's i think it's pretty bullish that larry fink is talking about real world assets being tokenized because that is really what blockchain is for you know what i mean yeah we have all these meme coins and shit coins and there are some legit you know products and services in the crypto space that benefit from being on chain but I, th I would say overall, it's a lot of vaporware and a lot of bullshit, which I think, you know, in the server, we're pretty much in agreement in that sense. The percentage of the market that is vaporware and bullshit, I think we disagree about. But I would say the majority of us think that the majority of what's out there in crypto is pretty much bullshit. But the thing that's interesting is that a lot of the projects that are more long term and that they don't really care about the price and the price continually moves up, generally speaking, they're they're leaning in the direction of real world assets. So it'll be yeah. interesting to see what happens this next cycle and for future cycles. Cause some of these projects, I think some of them, especially the ones that I'm in, they, they, they might last for five, 10 years or, or maybe even longer. We'll see obviously, but if this really does happen the way that it should happen theoretically, yeah, there's gonna be plenty of market share to go around for these real world asset incubators or chains whatever yeah i think the biggest issue is just going to be identifying the long-term ones right because people always compare crypto bubbles like the dot-com bubble but it's almost like that on steroids right because it's not like you can't really compare trying to build like a tech company to launching some 
shit coin that, you know, especially if you launch it on like Solana or something that is not going to cost anything. It's literally anybody can do it, you know, from their couch. You can't, you know, it's not like everybody can go and try to build a startup tech company out of, of nothing. So it's a little bit more convoluted in, in trying to weed out the long term uh, projects. Yeah, that's yeah, I mean, basically what it is. You're just trying to find the long term ones because we went over one couple months ago, tangible, that I haven't really looked up and then looked into them much further recently. I'm not sure like where they're at right now, but I don't think they're at the level on though. So, so you just got to not, it's not something you can just do, but yeah, it takes a little bit of time just looking into the projects and sometimes it, you got to just stick with a couple for a little bit just to see which ones outlast one another. Yeah, and a lot of them evolve and go like a different direction, right? We look at Theo because we've been that from the beginning when they first started. So it's evolved and uh, morphed into something a little differently from, I think, from their original vision. Yeah, an update on Tangible is their stable plane got depegged. There was a bunch of reasons that we can go into that. Maybe we can do a recap on what happened, but that happened back in October and it's still never repegged. I know they're trying to work on it and fix the project and stuff like that, but it's the 10th of October. It went from pegged at, let's say, a little over 97 cents down to 53 cents within three days massive cliff and it's trading right now at 64 cents projects like that have a long way to go but yeah there's a lot of space for for growth and just in terms of my portfolio allocation i'm not like trying to go all in on one because sloth was saying you don't know which one is going to be long term so you got to be diversified into a bunch of them so that if one hits like a billion or 10 billion market cap and you snipe it at 1 million or less actually is what we got um, other legit ones that are at like 100 million, 200 million right now that could easily, you know, 10, 20, 30 X in, in the next five to 10 years. Just something to think about, manage risk and really understand what these projects are capable of and the true use case for crypto for long-term holds. Yeah, speaking of, I, I think I saw some mention of ShopX. It was like the first time I'd heard of it in like the last year or two. So I'll have to go back and check in on them, see what they're doing. Pump my bags, dude. We're holding a whole bunch of that, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, I think we had them staked on. I don't even remember the name of the exchange. It was some crappy little centralized exchange. We had it staked on there. Yeah, it's still on there. Yeah. I got to figure out which one it was Hopefully that we had it on. Access. <laughs> <laughs> That's crypto, though. Yep. Remember where you put your bags, gentlemen. Thank you so much for the write-up this week. Great conversation. And as always, everyone is welcome and invited. The link is in the description below. And we are going to go ahead and move along. We'll bring up Eddie next for some weekly callbacks. All right. Figured we would just look back at Ondo since we looked at it on Tuesday. We're chatting about it. It's a bull coin. Let's do that. Tuesday when we were looking at this, this was the plan was if we can get dips down into this area, that's your buy the dip zone. However, since then we've had a bit more price action and there might be a sooner entry now. The last plan was like the next entry would be closes above here, but I think we can get something better and I, and I don't think that this is going to come down. If it does, great gift, but probably not going to happen anymore. So now I'm thinking if we start to reclaim this like range right here, that'd be a good spot to get back into it. This a little bit better. If we can reclaim back into this, that'd be a good trigger and it actually lines up with this too because now instead of this being the high that you want to see close above it's right here so it's basically the same spot give or take probably two or three percent but i'm looking to probably get in along with one of these two the safer one most likely would be if it reclaims right here above 848 just call it 85 cents if you can get some closes above that you're safe to aim for new highs you could be a bit more aggressive and just start entering with closes above here. But if you see, like we already did close above there three times and it came back down. So potential shift in structure with 4H closes or probably even hourly closes, I would take above 85 cents can get you back in the Ondo. So it's looking pretty good. We'll see what happens, but that's all for now. Thank you, Eddie. And look forward to your charts on T Tuesday in the server. Next up, we'll bring up GeForce. He'll probably go over a couple charts for us and also discuss inflation 
I'm looking forward to this chat. Earlier today, I did see that it looks like January 2020 compared to 2021, credit card debt is up about 46%, while of course, wages are dropping. So that was interesting that I saw this morning. So I look forward to a little discussion on inflation and whatever else you have in store for us, G-Force. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Christine. Yeah, I'm gonna cover inflation. I covered it uh, last month in the uh, Stock Saturday write-up and it's come around again and everybody can obviously see that we still have inflation in that write-up last month i talked about how the federal reserve bank has an excuse if they don't stamp out inflation completely or didn't do the job completely and that's the term sticky okay they did that way back in 2008, 2009, and a few other uh, areas where inflation was starting to raise its head. So what's interesting is that this last week in all the financial articles, the term sticky kept coming up. It's just, I'm like, okay, so they're already using this excuse. The Federal Reserve is saying that already. Now on Friday was the unemployment report. That was the first one for this month. It talked about last month, which was March. And the unemployment report basically went up in jobs. They were expecting 210,000 new jobs and that expectation got blown away. There was 300,000 new jobs that was created. And the other issue, I have it here in, in the write-up right here. This is the, uh, the paragraph. So you'll see here that they were expecting 210,000 and we actually had 300,000 on it. But what's also key is the uh, unemployment rate went down. It went down from 3.9% to 8%. So everybody's okay, 0.1%, that's not a big deal. But what the big deal is, it's going the wrong direction. Instead of going higher or staying flat at 3.9%, uh, it actually went down. So less people were unemployed, which means the Fed will not have a justification of cutting interest rates this year. And they really want to. There's basically, and I have this in this article that I'm gonna post real soon for uh, Stock Saturday, is that the federal governor of Chicago and the federal governor of Cleveland really don't want to cut rates. And that came out just after this unemployment report. So we have dissension on the uh, Federal Reserve Board. It's not, they're not in unity, they're arguing against each other, and that's where things are headed. In this article is two main questions. Will the Federal Reserve Bank get inflation back down to its 2% target? We're not even close to that. And how long, if they do, how long will it take, okay? So I'm looking at the 10-year is at basically 4.4% as it closed on Friday. Okay, it jumped on Friday. It went from just one day, it went from 4.1% to 4.4%. And the 30 year is at 4.47. So inflation is still going up, interest rates are still going up. And I'm going to look now. This is basically the 30 year bond, and for over 37 years. I've talked about how the 30-year bond has a 30-year cycle, which makes sense, right? So if we go back to 1981, it's up here around 14, over 14%, okay? So it's cycled all the way down and we got close to zero, actually prime was zero or close to zero back in 2020. So what's it doing now? It's just climbing up, okay? So we've hit, the bottom of that 30 year cycle and there's no other direction than to go up so it might go down and go back up and go down but the overall trend is now up for the 30 year bond cycle so just inflation is just going to get higher interest rates are going to get higher we might have a, a, a reprieve if we have a change of administration but we might not that's hard to talk about and hard to forecast but we are getting more inflation and one of my two key gauges is going shopping and buying gas if it prices are still going up or staying higher then we got inflation okay christine i'll turn it back over to you 
fantastic. I like to hear your updates on inflation. And I think that a lot of people have the mindset of just go out and make more money and then you don't have to worry about inflation. I see that a lot on Twitter and that's interesting, but you've got states like Alaska where they're paying $13 for a container of cranberry juice. Alaska is always high, but not that high. Definitely a good write-up and I like to read them. That's it for this week. As a DeFi Logic server member, you'll discuss markets daily and ape coins and trade with other members. Astrobit 2.0 is live and our BTC ETH and Doge strategy are now in beta testing. Join our server now. Early members get free server access for life and future discounts on additional products and services. See you next Sunday at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. See you, friends. Join us next week in Discord for Symposium Sunday at DeFiLogic.com.